Art Center, Art Center and uh, specifically welcome to the artist talk of the artist in residence from our artist accelerator program. <laughs> and this time we have three very interesting women. Um, Morgan Barnett, uh, Caroline Fighting, and Jessica Rayfield. Um, if you have a question, stick up your hand. I'm going to be there on the lookout to see if you um, if you have a question. There will be people so walking around to, to see this absolutely wonderful uh, Howland community open, and uh, we're just going to ignore them. So here we go. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> she wasn't there for the instructions. So um, I said very interesting because um, you are. And it's a kind of new for the Art Center too to have one studio artist and two artists that are branching out in that working by themselves in studio. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're first going to talk about um, what was important for you as an artist to partake in the Artist in Residency program. Uh, so Morgan, since you are holding the microphone and you all have to share, um, tell me um, what made you um, be part of the program? So I applied to the residency kind of on a whim. Um, I did not expect to get it, and it was very much like, okay, this would be really cool and really like validating for myself. Like if I did, um, I'm self-taught, so I don't have like a lot of art world experience. Um, so just like getting this residency was like just extremely like validating to um, be kind of like in a more professional setting. Mm -hmm. So you wanted this, you wanted to bump. Yeah, yeah. I um, I kind of wanted to like just like sort of understand like what um, would in, it what it would entail to like be a more professional artist um, and just kind of like uh, get more of a hand on like all the business aspects. Mm -hmm. And I think this residency like really like boosted me up there like really fast. Right. Right. And Carolee, um, you are a weaver, so that brought some extra, um, well, I don't want to call it challenges, mm -hmm. but maybe that was the case. Yeah, I don't know if I would consider them challenges either. So I really came to this residency because I was, um, I had to graduate art school about a year ago and I had my huge post art school burnout where I was like, I'm never going to do studio art again. I'm so sick of this. So I had my like little cool off period and in that time I had gone to weaving school which is really where I honed a lot of my skills and coming to this residency was really like a chance for me to reconnect and uh, to the part of my work that is conceptual and that is like I would consider like gallery art so it was really wonderful to be able to get back to that after I <laughs> to, like the year before said I wouldn't do it anymore because I was just so burnt out but it was really lovely to like be pushed to um, think in that way again and also be working on my business as well. So it's just kind of like getting me out of the slump is really what I like got from this residency and that's really and really exciting because now I have all these ideas. Okay. And uh, Jessica. Um, hi. So I am a studio artist. I do have a background in painting and drawing. Um, but with this residency, I was really interested in focusing a lot of research that I've been doing since I graduated um, with an MFA from OCAC outside of Portland before they closed <laughs> in 2019. So I do have a studio background, but um, illustration, which is what I've done with the work in this uh, residency, also has kind of an under, um, a misunderstood history within uh, arts and craft. So illustration does have a place in storytelling and graphic arts, 
that I sort of switched my focus from going from you know fine art painting to illustrating a story that I also wrote after I undertook the study of Yiddish during the pandemic. So and, and, and let me yeah, let me stop you for a moment. Um, so you had a specific project that you worked on. So what is the project? So yeah, that's how I applied to this residency. Um, as a as a as a professional artist and a studio artist, I had this idea that I have a specific outcome that I want to produce from the time frame. Um, I think that's one of the things I looked for in this residency was that there was um, a time frame and there was a schedule um, and kind of a pressure that would cause me to produce work. So the project that I applied with was um, producing an illustrated language primer, a Yiddish-English language primer, which um, also caused me to have to write the whole book during the residency. Um, so it was a really intensive way to spur my um, gathering of all of the language research and then also to um, come up with all of the illustrations that would illustrate that book as, um, as a way of gathering how my illustration and painting background can actually be a saleable product um, in addition to how painting to illustrate ideas can be used like for even for muraling that's kind of like an illustration um, process so uh, the project has specific uh, importance for me personally and culturally and as an artist i do also respond to the current moment like political moments and what it is that i'm seeing that i think i need to put out into the world um, so with this residency, I saw it as an opportunity to have guidance um, on a specific timeline that I would be able to work those different components of my practice um, into actually creating something um, that will go out into the world after we're done. So that, that goes uh, uh, a lot further than making paintings. Well, I shouldn't say further because that almost implies a value judgment. But um, there, there are other components. You mentioned a lot of research, and painters can do research too, but two languages coming together, and a story. Um, you called it a primer. What, what do you mean with a primer? So my project um, is an illustrated primer that is a storybook and it illustrates and introduces a language. Um, so I've been taking Yiddish uh, classes during the pandemic and those are at a college level, um, which is kind of a different process than how we learn language naturally when we're children. So I wanted to combine the two approaches um, with illustration and um, I have this little example here but I'll probably show it later um, just that learning a language isn't always about um, memorization of grammar it's also about diving into the culture and uh, hearing phrases that are actual phrases that people would say in a way that you can get a sense for the language so with it being a primer, um, Yiddish, the, the idea that I was trying to go uh, for is that Yiddish has a place in pop culture, in American pop culture, where if someone says the word Yiddish, you automatically think, boy, right? <laughs> or bagel, right? So there's actually a whole language that exists outside of those um, superficial ideas that we have about Yiddish. But to just present all of the language within one book would be impossible. So I wanted to make a very basic introduction, and that's why I call it a primer, but it also okay. has some illustrations that help you understand the information. Okay, okay. Um, um, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> no, thank you. It, it's really helpful. Um, Caroline, um, you also step out uh, out of the, the making a painting. So tell us a little bit about your medium and what you've made for this particular, what your project was. All right, so I am a weaver specifically in the Scandinavian tradition. So I use something called a countermarch loom, which goes back to the early 1700s. Um, 
it's not a debate whether it started in Sweden or Norway, but Scandinavia. And I had really like, became immersed in this technique of making over the summer when I studied at a Swedish weaving school. So while I was there, I noticed there were a lot of, like, there was fabric everywhere, and there was in every aspect of our lives. Like, we used hand-woven tablecloths and, like, hand-woven napkins, and they were on the walls. And that really, really reminded me of when I was a child, we would have all these blankets that were from my Norwegian grandmother. And that kind of the uh, utility, but the familiarity was really exciting to me as well. So I have endeavored to really go on making that, uh, these objects that can be a part of my daily life that really kind of stretch the memory and nostalgia of family connection and heritage. So during this residency, I've been making a lot of home use objects. So it started with, I made a run of 27 kitchen towels. <laughs> I, put, um, I put 20 meters on my loom and wove it all pretty much in the month of November. And that took a very long time, because uh, 21 meters is a lot of yarn. <laughs> so, um, a talk of you to get that time in perspective for 21 meters, which is roughly 21 yards, you know, rivet, rivet. Yeah. Um, how many inches a day do you make? I would come in and I would weave one kitchen towel a day, which was on weekdays and um, two a day on weekends. So a, a kitchen towel was 60 centimeters long. Um, I could not tell you what that is exactly in inches, but since I learned, uh, like I learned the Swedish way, I learned how to do all this in centimeters. So that's part of my metric. Two feet. Two feet? Okay. All right, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like I could make a towel in maybe about an hour and a half, but that's weaving time. You need to take into account setup time. So it took me maybe about 25 hours to set up my loom that much. So I would stand there and I would wind all the threads on by hand, and then you'd have to like, um, like organize them on the loom and put them on the loom and sit there and I threaded maybe 600 threads by hand. And they're like, I don't know, it doesn't feel like it takes a very long time because the process is so varied, but it does take a long time when you sit there and do a time audit. Yeah. So that was my first piece. And then after that, I did, um, I did a run of what will be table runners and wall hangings, but right now they're being exhibited as one long piece. But, but you made this connection between items for use and sort of a nostalgia, a memory of family. Correct, yeah. Connection. Like a tactile memory, like the memories that are held in touch and what kind of things plot can evoke. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I wanted to go to Morgan, All right. and uh, Morgan, you're a painter. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't ask any of you to hold up what, what you uh, um, have in front of your face, but maybe we should do that. Um, uh, what, we'll see, what we see, uh, Jessica, is a mock-up that she worked on with um, a graphic designer. We'll get back to that. And uh, Caroline, what, this is called Daily Play. That was, that was the title of this yeah. piece of cloth. So what would it be used for? So this is um, a tea towel, essentially. I would personally use it, oh, thank you. I would personally use it in uh, the bathroom. I have a set of four of them, actually, besides this one that I use in my bathroom, and I just wipe my hands on it. But okay. you could theoretically use it in the kitchen, but I don't trust myself for okay. that. And then um, uh, Morgan has a little painting, and we're all sitting uh, somewhat far away, so I really encourage you to go and look up close uh, after this is uh, done. Um, it's a small painting because there is, what is the, the brush size that you use, Morgan? Um, pretty small. Um, I use the smallest brush I could find. I couldn't tell you exactly what size it was, yeah. um, but especially for the detail work on the beetles. Uh, so what, 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 what was the, you said you wanted to become more of a professional artist and, mm -hmm. and you produced a number of paintings. So did, did you have a coherent uh, theme for them or what is your general subject matter? What's special about your paintings? Um, these paintings, they do in some ways have like a very loose narrative. Um, it's more about kind of like processing life. Um, I, in my daily life, I work as a plant ecologist um, 
field botanist. So um, at the point when I got the residency, I had just come back from working in Eastern Oregon out in the sagebrush step for about uh, a little less than a year. Um, so it was just kind of processing my time out there. Um, so the majority of my paintings um, reflect that, um, usually in like some form of like plant symbolism or green symbolism. So, um, so your two careers, so to speak, really influence each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think if I didn't have the career I would, my work would look um, a whole lot different. Um, and I think just um, in my daily life, that's kind of like where I get um, inspiration from the things I want to work with and kind of like what um, kind of like sparks my heart and like what I kind of want to like depict in my paintings. Um, what do you enjoy in, in the paintings? Um, and and uh, the small brushes? Um, I work really small a lot of times. Like it's kind of a space constraint. Um, and also because I'm just like, I feel like I'm still starting out. Like before this residency, I maybe did like two or three pieces a year. Um, and so this residency has really made me like kind of like focus and uh, use my time a lot more um, and like actually have a reason to paint more. Um, a lot of times I'll work really small um, because, yeah, because of time and space. Um, but I really enjoy like just doing a lot of like really nitpicky details um, and especially in acrylic, um, you can kind of like see like there's just a lot of like really tiny stuff I like to fit in. Um, and in this, I, um, this is oil and cold wax with um, a lot of my own paint that I uh, gathered from like soil around Eastern Oregon. Um, and that was really interesting to just kind of um, learn to use the oil paint, like how it behaves a lot differently than the acrylic that I'm used to. Um, so it's interesting that practical things take over sometimes your artwork. I don't have a lot of space, I make small paintings. Um, Carolyn, is that an issue for you too, uh, having practical? Yeah, 100%. So um, one of the reasons I did make so many things was with this residency is because I had the space for my loom. My loom is... Um, 150 centimeters of weaving width, it's quite large, and right now it's in storage in my garage. So I am going to be shifting into doing band weaving, so I have these little petals, and then the way that works is you tie yourself across the room from your weaving, and you just kind of do it off of your own body. So I really appreciate that there's so many techniques of weaving out there that I really can transform my practice to fit wherever space I'm in, but right now I cannot do things on the big loom. Yeah, because your loom is at least as wide as the table that you're sitting behind. Yes, I can sit inside it. And it's probably four or five times as deep. Yeah, it is quite deep. It is big, but yeah. And then and, um, it has some height too. But it's my forever loom. <laughs> yeah, this is the big challenge for weavers. Uh, it definitely is, but... Um, do I have a kitchen table or a loom? I know, I, I keep trying to... And when I move, I'm like, oh, do I need a couch? I could just have a loom room. That's the living room. <laughs> uh, Jessica, do you have practical things that influence the art that you're making for this particular project? Um, yes, the story of this book um, comes from my own life. Uh, it was the idea of the primer is to not only introduce um, a language which is not very well known um, outside of the communities that speak it, um, Yiddish, but also to introduce some aspects of um, American Jewish experience and culture, and so that's my experience. Um, and that's why I chose to write a story that has very simple uh, sentences about an experience that I'm very familiar with, um, which was passed down to me, which is making matzo ball soup. Um, meaning the subject matter has all to do with this cultural inheritance um, that I wished to highlight. And so you will see pages of things like, this is one of the ingredients, you know, and in my family, this is something that I learned to use. It's not what everybody learns to use but um, parsley, you know, so I did an illustration of this in, uh, ingredient that is specific to this primer um, to tell the story of how do you make matzo ball soup. Um, so again, trying to come from like a, 
an uh, in intuitive way of looking at language is that you speak about the things that you're doing and your experience. Um, but also these are words that people might not have ever thought of as um, in Yiddish. You so, know? so did you look for a story that had the possibility of a lot of different items to introduce? Yes, I think the more that I thought about matzo ball soup as a subject, the more I realized how much I could say about it, which seems really funny. But when you do start to focus on one idea, if you think of it, how do I tell this as a story that other people would be able to engage with? Um, and what are the goals that I have in teaching the language part? I started doing things like breaking down, well, what are the ingredients for the soup? And then what could it be a sentence that you could say about this? like? The parsley is green, then you can learn the word grin for Yiddish, is green in Yiddish. But also, like, what else could be said is like, there are two eggs, or the eggs are white. And then these are ideas that go into the story and also help fill out the whole picture of the idea of making a matzo ball soup. Um, and then that also was able to translate into the higher ideas which I wanted to communicate, which were ideas about love and love for your culture. Um, and those are very personal for me. So um, practically, those are things that I live every day. And I also make matzo ball soup probably at least twice a month, which you can check with my fiance. <laughs> um, but we have these experiences that are every day that are built into who we are and i guess if you don't stop to think about it it could just go unnoticed yeah. so if you're making a, a a small story book for kids although small is a it's a lot of work relative <laughs> a relative um, that that's clear that it is about storytelling but do you uh, Morgan and Carolyn, do you also have a feeling that you are working on storytelling in your work? Carolyn. Uh, I'm next in line. I would definitely say so. I think it's a story about myself. It's a story about like my Scandinavian heritage, but I also feel like I am storytelling in the sense that this is a skill and a way of working that um, if people are not actively trying to learn and hungry for it, it will go away. So I feel like I am like actively writing a story and that I am learning and I'm spending all this time researching and reading these old books and trying to find classes to protect this beautiful skill. But then again, if it's not gone yet, I know a lot of weavers, so. <laughs> and Morgan, do you have to feel that your work represents some type of storytelling as well? or? Definitely. Um, each of my pieces has like a really specific simple narrative. Um, I do think that um, like a lot of it will be different for each person, um, and I really love that like viewers will um, like have a different interpretation of like what it means. Um, usually, I go with um, like dream symbolism or um, like herbalism as kind of like a metaphor for like what each piece stands for. So. I've kind of constructed like a like simple web for myself, um, and that is is telling a story of each piece. So like there will be kind of like a um, symbols that stand in or like plants that stand in for like specific meanings. Um, so they each kind of like lead their own story, each piece, and um, they do kind of work together to kind of explore different ideas, like um, taking time to rest or like building a home, like things like that. Um. Would you agree with the characterization as uh, somewhat surrealism in your work, or not at all? I do. Um, I do see a lot of surrealism, but um, the surrealist painters and the movement aren't necessarily um, in my inspirations, but um, I do think my work does very much mm -hmm. fit in that vein. I wanted to talk a little bit about materials that that all of you have used because Morgan already hinted at that she was collecting pigments or rocks uh, in Eastern Oregon. So tell us a little bit on how you do it and why, because you can buy brown. Um, I started doing it, so um, before I um, tried any of my own paint, I've mostly been painting in acrylic. 
um, and a little bit of watercolor, but mostly just acrylic. Um, and um, I found that like even though it's like a super accessible medium, it's um, be just because it dries so quickly and it's readily available. Um, I felt like really strange about it because like it's a, it's a plastic synthetic pigment. Um, so I kind of wanted to like experiment with more natural pigments. Um, my mom does a lot of natural dye and it's always kind of like been um, part of something that we do. Um, and so I kind of wanted to explore that in paint. Um, and I first um, like came across like working with like soil um, when I was at Oregon State um, taking a soil morphology and classification class. We had these like Dory pits, Dory pits were sort of like a bright orange clay um, and I thought that would like make a really interesting pigment and so I kind of like filed that away like in the back of my brain um, and then later on I was like okay like I want to make my own paint so that started with making my own uh, watercolor um, out of specific soils usually around like John Day like um, you know like the John Day fossil beds like there's a lot of good soil from like that kind of area um, so I started with that and made watercolor and then um, but I like I'm not like a watercolor artist um, so I was like, okay, like I'll switch this to oil paint. So um, the process, you um, take your foil um, and then you um, kind of grind it down. You like filter out all of the things that like aren't the foil that you want. How do you grind it down? Um, in a mortar and pestle. Um, you can also just use like a rock, but it's nice to have like a nice like, actual touch basin for it. Um, and then you can uh, strain it. So like take like, I don't know, like a tea strainer or something and just like, uh, just make the parts look like as fine as possible and then you take what is called a molar um, m-u-l-l-e-r and you um, have a plate and then you take the molar and you um, put your pigment on this plate and you add your um, medium so if you're making oil paint you would use like linseed oil or walnut oil and you would incorporate that into your dry pigment. Um, if you're using watercolor, you would um, use like gum arabic and um, like honey and some kind of preservative like a clove oil um, if you so choose. And um, then you would uh, have your pigment and then your, um, your wet ingredients and then you would grind it all up and you just kind of like smear it around the plate and like kind of incorporate it so it's like all mixed and like get as fine as you possibly can. Um, that's the process. It's um, It takes a long time but it's pretty rewarding and I love just like seeing the color just like kind of like come out and like there'll be some where like some soil I gathered um, sediment from um, the Elver Desert which is a dry lake bed um, and I thought it would be like super light because it's like a very light soil but um, it ended up being like just a pretty like standard like mid dark brown so it's really interesting to see like how a uh, pigment will transform in color. When that like, that, the that was going to be my question. How do you decide on what rock or soil to pick up to make what color? Do you have in mind what you're going to do with it or you're still experimenting? I'm definitely still experimenting. I definitely have like so much to learn with it um, since I'm still pretty new. Um, I only need like maybe four or five pigments. Um, I have used also botanical pigments, but I'm really hesitant to use them in oil because so they're not light fast. Is there any literature for you to uh, use as a guidance or is it all um, experimentation? Um, I will look at um, blogs online. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head that I can think of. There's one book I have um, I don't remember the author, but um, I this definitely isn't like exclusive to me. Um, there are definitely people I'm learning from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Carolyn, uh, you use thread. I do, <laughs> but thread, thread isn't thread isn't thread, right? Yes. But so, what? Why do you pick certain materials and and? Well, I think that the me selecting materials kind of is twofold. So it's like what is historically used and what is practical. So as of late, I've pretty much been exclusively using cotton, linen, and wool. So that is what you will see in historical textiles from Nordic regions. But also, it just lasts. It lasts a long time. Like linen's very absorbent; it gets softer with age. Wool's very warm. 
It lasts a long time if you take care of it properly and don't put it in the dryer. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the materials I've used at this residency specifically come from like Swedish yarn companies, but that's not necessarily because it's from a Nordic region, that's because I went to a Swedish weaving school and those are the materials we use, so that's what I'm familiar with. So I have all my little like notes and sheets with maps and like yarn I've used before. And it's always safe to use yarn you've used before because you know what to expect. So. A lot of my choice of materials does come from like looking in uh, online digital museums of like things from the 17s and 1800s and then also just thinking practically like um, this is machine washable if you wash it on cold and I'm like I would never make a hand towel that you have to hand wash that seems like more effort than it's worth so it's, uh, worth. So it's like those two things together like how will this work in my life and what was used previously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jessica. Uh, you uh, show in the show drawings with graphite and charcoal and, and um, there, there's a lot of stuff that, that goes into getting that print. Yes, there's quite the process, which um, I was really happy to be able to show those multiple layers, especially the way that um, you hung them, Hester. <laughs> Um, to show that there is a process of development, um, particularly since this was a book from scratch, uh, there was the writing of the manuscript, which actually was um, quite laborious. You know, it takes a lot of time even to just write one sentence that is a good sentence. <laughs> so I think writers probably will also say that's familiar, but um, there was that whole process. And then for the artwork, so my painting practice has typically involved using oil paint, but with a very, um, a lot of, um, uh, not turpentine, but rather than using uh, heavy body oils, using um, the paint thinner style. That was my style in my, um, in my studio practice. And so for this book, I was trying really hard to figure out what is the best um, paper or uh, ground, you know, like a paperweight that I would be able to paint onto. And I had a lot of trial and error to figure out how can I make these um, acrylic paintings that wouldn't warp a uh, paper um, significantly so that it can be scanned. Because, you know, thinking of the end product, even though that's not the best way to make art that you care about, it was important for this project because it needs to be able to be It's essential to, for an illustrator. Well, yeah, for making a, a, a reproducible uh, file or a book. Yes, I was thinking, how can I do this going from that studio background? So I transitioned to paper and acrylic, um, which I had done for some you know, illustrations in the past. I had used um, a heavyweight uh, mixed media paper and what I've ended up um, landing on for this project is that I'm working off of watercolor paper, um, unprimed watercolor paper. So it's able to take paint quite well um, and not warp if I use a lot of paint but not a lot of water. So that's like the style that I've worked out for this. But um, what you were talking about in the exhibit, which you can see if you come to see the exhibition also, is that there are uh, there's a process of sketching, you know, just crazy wild sketching where I get my ideas out and this is the idea that matches that page. So like, this is what I'm trying to say with this, uh, this illustration matches this sentence. Um, from the sketch, which is on a newsprint and, um, you know, is disposable, but uh, goes uh, very quickly, I can work up another graphite drawing on a heavier paper that helps me, you know, settle in, oh, this is going to be the final composition. Um, but I'll still be working out some small details and where do, where do the words need to go on this page. Um, so going from sketching to a graphite drawing, I would then go to the final watercolor paper, which I don't want to mess up, you know, like this is going to be the one that goes to the printer once it's been photographed or scanned. Um, so for those uh, pieces, I would work on the heavier uh, watercolor paper and um, work from the sketches and try to capture the essence of what it is that I've gotten out in that looser drawing, find the elements that really communicate. This is what I'm trying to say in this illustration. Um, and then place that 
on the paper in a way that I can still get in with kind of a bit of a loose hand with some um, acrylic paint. And you'll see that I like to use a lot of bold colors with this book because I only have so many opportunities to make an impression with the illustration. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did go um, for a very bold color palette and with the watercolor paper and the acrylics that I'm using, which are the plastic acrylics, <laughs> Sorry, Morgan. <laughs> I didn't grind my own acrylics for this project. Um, but I, I did end up using a mix of kind of a watercolor approach where I do some areas that I lay down a little bit of water first and then I'll let the paint spread through that to make a lighter background maybe. And then come back on the top with some big blobs of paint and then push that around to make um, a bold and less transparent color that has um, been reading pretty well once it's scanned. This is one of the looser wash illustrations that I was very surprised. The graphic designer that I've worked with is very talented and she was able to um, take this from a sketch and that I really enjoyed. I, I liked the way that it had come out and she was like, that's beautiful, we need to use that. Right. So, so, um, so this one worked out well for that. But. So we've all, you've all talked a little bit on how you were but I would like to know what is your biggest challenge uh, in the work that you've done for um, the residency? Who wants to start with that? Carolyn, do you want to start? Okay, I'll start. I would say my biggest challenge is not necessarily making the work because I think that's really I don't know, it just, I'm, I'm in a groove, it feels really good. I think the hardest part is really making sense of what I'm thinking and what it means and what is the purpose of this work. Like, um, I was told in art school that you cannot make and um, critique in the same headspace, and I thoroughly believe that. So really kind of the critiquing and piecing together and like trying to find the words to, to put to what I feel, um, even to myself, so I can say it to others, I think is definitely the hardest part takes a lot of writing and editing, and um, it's still always a work in progress. It's different every exhibition. Okay. Uh, Morgan, what's your biggest challenge? I agree with Carlina. Um, I really struggle with like um, vocalizing, like how um, a narrative will fit into a piece. Um, so I feel like a lot of times it just like becomes this like coherent or incoherent ramble when I like don't write it down. Um, so for this residency, like a lot of pieces, I was like, okay, like how do I want this to work together? Like, will this make any sense in like a narrative form? Um, so yeah, I definitely also struggled with um, just like how to convey like a specific um, emotion or a specific like method in a piece. Um, and that is definitely like a like larger issue, just like, you know, like how do you communicate your work and like how do you um, like, I don't know, um, think about what an audience would see, like, in your pieces, um, and, um, I know, like, some people say, like, okay, like, you can't, like, really, um, based off, like, what an audience will think of your work, you just have to, like, make it, and then, once you put it out into the world, I, I would have to say that, that I was impressed with all three of you when I asked you for little blurbs for each piece, that A, you did that, and B, they are interesting to read and they expand my understanding of your work. So it may have been hard for you, but uh, you, I think you did a good job. Jessica, what is your, your um, biggest challenge? Um, so I live an hour away from Corvallis. I was very lucky to get to have the space here. Um, so a challenge for me has been um, making that trip and getting to have enough time in the studio. Um, I was very lucky to only be working three days a week during the rest of you know, my time here, uh, working on a job. And I was able to really hone in on, as soon as I get here, getting to work. Um, which I think is a, a really typical challenge for studio work is, um, you know, knowing that you have stuff to make, um, but not really being able to get down to work all of the time. So 
I found the challenge of having to travel here actually helped kick me into higher gear for making stuff. And um, I think one of the, the, the challenges I haven't quite overcome yet is that this is my first book and it's my first illustrated book and I'm looking a lot into how to get it published. And there's a whole world out there that is about publishing and also we mentioned this as a children's book, but the way that I am thinking about it is as a book for kids and their adults. Um, because there are a lot of people that do have um, Jewish American heritage who knew a little bit of Yiddish, you know, maybe from a, a, a previous generation, um, but who want to reconnect with that heritage. And so this is actually a book that is designed for adults as well, you know, to learn something in a way that isn't um, undignified. So I am still struggling with how to put the language together for that um, around marketing it and finding a publisher, but um, I have some good leads and I have a lot of friends that are author illustrators. And so that has been another part of the process while doing the studio work is all of the background stuff that you have to do, which I is really, really intense. It, it, it's really interesting that all three of you mentioned something as your biggest challenge that was not making the work. You seem to be really confident in making the work. That's, that's it. So um, now that you're so confident, what was your most rewarding experience? When did you know, and I'm not talking about the residency uh, only now, but when did you know, I can do this? When did you get that confidence? <laughs> well, I'll just, yeah, I'll just pass it back down. Um, but I do have a, a specific to this residency moment that really helped me um, gain confidence in this project in particular. The Open Studios, um, the Corvallis Art Walk, CA, <laughs> we were asked to participate, to partake in that, to have our studio open to the public, which I've done in the past. I've been parts of um, artist studios where we have you know, uh, art open studios and people come and talk to you about your work. But this project is so personal for me and I've been working really hard on it and putting it out there. Um, and during that art walk, the Corvallis art walk and our open studio, we had a lot of people that came through and that was very surprising. It was at least 15 people that I talked to in my studio. And it turned out that a lot of them felt very receptive to this project and they gave me such great feedback. It really helped build my belief in what I was doing, and I felt so grateful for that experience. Um, it wasn't something that I anticipated, one, because we still have, you know, COVID, COVID precautions going on, but um, having people come through and respond to this work and say, I would really like to see this in the world, you know, it was, um, that was, that was not something I expected, and it is also, when you're an artist, I'll just say this for everyone in the world, and you too as well, you have to keep working on your projects whether you feel confident about it or not. It, it requires you to plant your feet and to do what you're going to do. But you can do that and not connect with an audience. And so the fact that people came through and saw this work and connected with me about it was really rewarding. Gary, Gary confidence. All right, I, I have a two-part answer. So the moment I really got confidence in the skill of weaving, I would say, happened over the summer while I was studying at Bev's Bugu Weaving School. So I have been weaving for about, on this style, for about eight months. That's less than a year. I've not been doing this very long at all, but um, it was one of my first pieces there. It's actually the stripe piece in the, um, the secondary portion of the Green Men Gallery. And I just felt the motion click, like my feet were fast. I was flying, I was like beating in a really good rhythm and it felt almost musical. And I was like, yes, my body can do this. And that's the moment I like embodied the motion. So that's first, first part is when I got confidence in weaving and that's really when I felt the motion click. And the second part I would say is um, during this residency, I also did a Christmas market. That was my big uh, kind of driving factor to make 27 towels in a month. So I was trying to finish that up for a, a Christmas market. And really just getting to talk to everyone and have everyone touch it and tell me like, um, 
how, how much they uh, appreciated the work I was doing. So I was doing a specifically a Scandinavian Christmas market. So everyone there really also had the heritage connection. And that's when I really felt that like, this is important work and I can do it and other people will appreciate it. Oh, very good. Uh, Oregon. So I'm definitely like thinking like there are multiple parts to just levels of confidence. Um, first, when I, um, was accepted to this residency, that was like, oh, like, okay, I can do something. Um, so that was like a first boost of confidence. Um, and another came when I was um, working on this piece um, and doing the Beatles. Um, I had not painted a bug before. Um, so I was just like, oh my God, like, how do, how do I do this? Like, I was just like the highlights on the page. Just like, like, like so, um, it was just kind of like after like layering all the paint and like and it was coming together I was like okay like I can do this I like this piece um and then just like looking at that piece once it's done and be like hi you like I, I'm like fond of it and that was like a really big milestone because I feel like a lot of pieces I've had in the past I haven't necessarily like enjoyed the finished product or I'll be like oh like I could have done something different but like having a piece that like was a finished product and that I was like okay I like you I'm happy with you and like just being like, hello, like every time it's on the wall. Um, that was like one thing I really enjoyed. And then I think another confidence boost was um, just like every time I try and like paint a new thing, like um, the blankets on the piece, that's like the skull cap with the buckets up above. Um, the fabric kind of was like one that I was like threading, like, okay, like do I paint this fabric? Do I not paint this fabric? So like just um, like busting down, like actually painting them. So I think confidence just comes from like working through something. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like I'm still like working on boosting my confidence. And what, was on. there for all of you a pressure that you had to produce something that was going to be in an exhibit? What was that unpleasant or pleasant for you? Um, I really liked it. If I don't have a deadline, I feel like it's much more difficult for me to do something. Um, so I really enjoyed like having like a set date. I was like, okay, I have to finish these pieces by, and I, um, I think that was really nice um, to like have a set. Okay, I need to have this many pieces by then. Um, I found it very helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't think the pressure necessarily came from like the pending exhibition so much as like the amount of time I had in my studio space. So I was like, oh. When I'm done here, I'm going to need to pack up my loom and I won't be able to take it out until June. So that knowledge, I'm like, got to weave every every day I can and just really get in as much time as I can with this technique before I have to shift gears for a couple months and can reconnect with it later in the summer. Yeah. Um, I do feel like this timeline was one of the things that I really benefited from of um, in the residency, knowing that we did have this exhibition opportunity. Um, but for me, it was really joyful because I had this idea, you know, that I already was dedicated to, or I knew I was going to be doing it. So with this first batch of paintings, it was very exciting for me to think people will see these and this is real, like this is really going out into the gallery. Um, so that it was, it was, it was an impetus um, but it was already something that was going to happen. So it was really nice to have the knowledge that people will see these things and I get to share this story. Um, and then I do have um, another exhibition following in Portland coming later in May after I've completed all of the illustrations for this book. So getting to this point has been really, uh, it was very motivating to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I ask my last question, is there something you want to convey to us that we didn't really talk about? No? I'll think about that for a second. <laughs> okay. I then. hope you read my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll plug for you that anything that Jessica sells is going to go to uh, making this book happen. Yeah, that is, that is a really good point. Having, having a, a book published is not easy, 
And nowadays, publishers would prefer that you do everything digitally so they can just get a digit. And so doing it the old fashioned way is, is rewarding, but it's also a hurdle for getting it published. I could say one thing, if yeah. you don't mind. I would encourage people to go out of your comfort zone, you know, if you've never heard of, like for my part of this, if you've never heard of Yiddish or never thought of it as a heritage language and it's not something you've ever explored or looked into, maybe it's something that could be meaningful for you. And then similarly, I think with um, Carolina's work, you know, maybe you've never thought about the work that goes into a textile. So, and then Morgan, you know, grinding and designing your own designs. All, all of these, I think all of our artworks have something to offer that is about slowing down and about thinking about what meaning you're putting into the world. So um, I think with our exhibition, it's a really, it's a nice moment to get a, acquainted with those products that we've I, I like that thinking of slowing down. Uh, I think that is one of the big things art can do for people. S look at it thoughtfully, slow down, look at something for more than, uh, I don't know what it is, what they time that people look at a painting in an exhibit. It's, it's, it's 25 seconds or something. Short. So the slow down, look at something and think about it is, uh, um, thank you for bringing that up. And now for something completely different. If money and space was not something you would have to think about, what artwork would you like to own? And owning it is important because owning um, means a certain commitment to that artwork. All right, I'll go first because I'm holding the microphone. Um, I thought I'd like, I got a heads up on this question and I was thinking about it and the answer to me was actually very simple because I own a print of this painting. So it is called A Winter Night in the Mountains by the Norwegian neo-romantic painter Al Tulberg. And I just, can you say that again? A Winter Sorry. Night in the Mountains by the neo-romantic painter Harald Solberg. And I saw this um, probably for the first time when I was 12 or 13. So we were visiting family in Oslo and we went to the National Gallery and I remember walking in. And it's huge, it takes up most of the wall. And it was just glowing, it was luminous. It was like the blue was radiating out of this painting. It's like um, a painting of the mountains up above the Arctic Circle. And I just thought it was the most beautiful thing ever. I stared at it for a long time, which is crazy considering you're 12 and you probably don't have the built-in appreciation for art quite yet. But we went to the gift shop and I saw they had posters of it and I'm like, I have to have that. And it's been hanging in my wall for years and years and years. And I would just like love to have the original because the, the luminous quality really doesn't come through in the print. But I still love having it. It reminds me of uh, the time I did see yeah. it. And that's the first time I really think I connected with art. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, this question like really stumped me. Um, it, so, um, I'm probably not pronouncing uh, her name right, but um, Joy Cosima's Infinity Mirrors, um, that would be... Um, Can you say that again? Joy Cosima's Infinity Mirrors, um, it's an installation of mirrors and lights. So um, when you, I've, I've not seen it in person, when you um, walk, and you can walk into it, um, so when you go there, it's like, just like an expanse of like light and space. Um, because the mirrors are um, reflecting all the light. Um, and it's just like, um, be, like beautifully immersive, like all of her works, like you may have seen like her dot pieces or your rooms, um, but just like the like fully immersive quality of it, I think would be like amazing to just like be in there. Um, and I also think it would be really cool to um, like see it in different spaces at different lights. So just like, um, the ability to um, just kind of like watch like change like in that room, I think would be pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you own it, you can go into it and stay as, lo as long in it as you want. It's a good thing to own. Um, I had a kind of a different response to the question. 
Uh, I do think that when we make a work, it is important to have, um, you know, like respect of the person's work and not to take that, you know, um, like if someone appropriates something, I don't think that that's right. So, but ownership, I was thinking if I, if it were, if money were no issue and I could take any piece of art that I wanted, I would think that um, it would actually be the most meaningful for me to have any artifact that's been appropriated from a previous culture and have that returned to the home culture, the community that it came from. Um, because I think that there's something that ownership says to me that is um, contrary to uh, understanding what artifacts can actually mean to um, a community. And even calling them artifacts is artificial. So um, for me, that comes back to um, artworks that were uh, looted during the um, Second World War. And so for communities to lose an artwork, um, whether it's you know something that your family made or something that was purchased by your family, I would just want to return those. So it wouldn't be about getting a work personally that I would live with, it would be about returning works to people that have lost them. It, it does speak about that commitment part though. Oh yeah, well my commitment is to improving community experience. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask something? Uh, here we go. Pastor, I don't know the details of how the residents here is, are chosen. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of process? That's my job. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Claire Elam, I'm the Artist Accelerator Program Director. Um, so the residents are chosen through an application process in the late summer, early fall. Um, it's an open application and they're really chosen for, um, while their art is definitely a part of it, it's more for their um, interest and willingness to learn about how um, to increase their business education um, through the pro process. It's about three to four months long. They go through a series of lectures, um, all based around kind of startup business education, as well as one-on-one um, -on -one coaching with me, group meetings, um, critiques, and then they also have a set course load as well. Um, and then kind of the culmination in, uh, from their studio work is the, this exhibit. Does the art center provide the studio space? Yes, we do. And where's that? It's down in the basement right now. Um, in the past, we've also worked with uh, Downtown Corvallis Association mm -hmm. for off-campus or off-site um, studio space, but that was not this year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, uh, good question, thank you. Um, I think we've come to the end of the, of the talk. I would like to thank you very much for being part of this. And again, the blurbs with each piece, kudos to you. Remember that uh, when a curator asks for that, it gives us as the audience an extra way to understand your work. And that is in the end what you want. Uh, it's not, uh, taking the mojo out of it, not to worry. So thank you, keep making art, and we hope to see you lots of time. Thank you audience, thank you Claire for putting this uh, program together, and we'll see you next time.